from a game theory perspective? Do you think we're living in a simulation? Do you think we're listen, living inside a video game created by somebody else? <laughs> well, I think, well, so what was the second part of the question? Do I think we're living in a simulation and? Uh, a simulation that is observed by somebody for purpose of entertainment. So like a video game, are we listening? Are we, because there's a, it's like Phil Hellmuth type of situation, yeah. right? Like um, there's a creepy level of like, this is kind of fun and interesting. Like there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. I mean, that could be somehow integrated into the evolutionary process where it, the way we perceive and- our, Are you asking me if I believe in God? Um, Sounds like it. Kind of, but God seems to be not optimizing uh, in the different formulations of God that we conceive of. He doesn't seem to be, or she, optimizing for uh, like personal entertainment. <laughs> uh, maybe the well, older gods did, but the, 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 you know, just like basically like a teenager in, in their mom's basement watching, create a fun right. universe to observe so, what kind of crazy shit might happen. Okay, so to try and answer this, um, do I think there is some kind of ex extraneous intelligence to like our, you know, classic measurable universe that we you know can measure with convent you know through our current physics and uh, uh, instruments? I think so. Yes. Um, Partly because I've had just small little bits of evidence in my own ex in my own life, which have made me question. Like, so I was a diehard atheist um, even five years ago. Uh, you know, I got into like the rationality community. Big fan of Less Wrong. Uh, continue to be an incredible uh, resource. Um, but I've just started to have too many little <sighs> snippets of experience, which don't make sense with the current sort of purely materialistic um, explanation of how reality works. Um, Isn't that just like a humbling practical realization that we don't know how reality works? Isn't that just a reminder to yourself? Totally. Yeah, no, it's it's a reminder of epistemic humility yeah. because I fell too hard. You know, same same as people like I think you know many people who are just like my religion is the way. This is the correct way. This is the work. This is the law. Um, you are immoral if you don't follow this. Blah blah blah. I think they are lacking epistemic humility. They're a little too too much hubris there. But similarly, I think the sort of the Richard Dawkins brand of atheism is too is too rigid as well and doesn't. Uh, you know, I th there's a way to try and navigate these questions, which still honors the scientific method, which I still think is our best sort of realm of like reasonable inquiry, you know, a method of inquiry. Um, so an example, um, I have two kind of notable examples that like really rattled my, my, uh, my cage. Uh, the first one was actually in 2010, early on in, um, uh, quite early on in my poker career. And I, the the I, the, uh, the remember the Icelandic volcano that erupted that like shut down kind of all Atlantic airspace, um, and I it meant I got stuck down in the south of France. I was there for something else, um, and I, I couldn't get home. And someone said, "Well, there's a big poker tournament happening in Italy. Maybe do you want to go?" I was like, "Oh right, sure. Like let's you know got a train across, found a way to get there." Um, and it, the buy-in was five thousand euros, which was much bigger than my bankroll would normally allow. And so I. Uh, played a feeder tournament, won my way in, kind of like I did with the Monte Carlo big one. Um, uh, so then I won my way, you know, from 500 euros into 5,000 euros to play this thing. And on day one of then the big tournament, where it turned out to have, it was the biggest tournament ever held in Europe at the time. It got over like 1,200 people, absolutely huge. And I remember they dimmed the lights uh, for before, you know, the normal shuffle up and deal uh, to tell everyone to start playing. And they played uh, Chemical Brothers' Hey Boy, Hey Girl, um, which I don't know why it's notable, but it was just like a really, it was a song I always liked. It was like a, one of these like pump me up songs. And I was sitting there thinking, oh yeah, it's exciting. I'm playing this really big tournament. And out of nowhere, just suddenly this voice in my head, just, and it sounded like my own sort of, you know, when you say, you think in your mind, you hear a voice kind of, right? At least I do. Um, 
And so it sounded like my own voice and it said, you are going to win this tournament. And it was so powerful that I got this like wave of like, you know, sort of goosebumps down my body. And I even, lo- I remember looking around being like, did anyone else hear that? And obviously people are in their phones like, no, no one else heard it. And I was like, okay. Six days later, I win the fucking tournament out of 1,200 people. And I, I, to the, I, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. Um, okay, yes, m- maybe I have that feeling before every time I play and it's just that I happen to, you know, because I won the tournament, I retroactively remembered it. Mm-hmm. But or, that's the, just... or the feeling gave you a kind of, now from the film Helmuthian. Well, exactly. Like, like it gave you a confident, a deep confidence. And it did. It definitely did. Like I remember then feeling this like sort of, well, although I remember then on day one, I then went and lost half my stack quite early on. And I remember thinking like, oh, well, that was bullshit. You know, <laughs> what kind of premonition is this? Yes. Thinking, oh, I'm out. But, you know, I managed to like keep it together and recover. And then and then just went like pretty perfectly from then on. And either way, it definitely instilled me with this confidence. And I don't want to put a, I don't, I can't put an explanation. Like, you know, was it some, you know, huge extra extra you know supernatural thing driving me Mm -hmm. or was it just my own self-confidence and so on that just made me make the right decisions i don't know and i don't i'm not going to put a frame on it i i think i think i know a good explanation so we're a bunch of npcs living in this world created by in the simulation and then people uh, uh not people creatures from outside of the simulation uh sort of can tune in and play your character and that feeling you got is somebody just like, shh, they got to play a poker tournament it through felt, you. Honestly, it felt like that. <laughs> it did actually feel a little yeah. bit like that. But it's been 12 years now. I've retold the story many times. Like, I don't you're even know a, how much I can trust my memory. You're just you know? an NPC retelling the same story. Because they just played the tournament and left. Yeah, they're like, oh, that was fun. Cool. Yeah, you know. cool. Next thing. Um, it, <laughs> and it now was, you're, for the rest of your life, left as a boring NPC retelling this well, story and of greatness. It, well, it was, and what was interesting was that after that, then I didn't obviously win a major, major tournament for quite a long time. And it left, that was that was actually another sort of dark period because I had this incredible, like the highs of winning that, you know, just on a like material level were insane, winning the money. I was on the front page of newspapers because it was like this girl that came out of nowhere and won this big thing. Um, and so again, like sort of chasing that feeling was, was difficult. Um, but then on top of that, there was this feeling of like, almost being touched by something yeah. bigger that was like, uh. Um, and also maybe, did you have a sense that I might be somebody special? Like th- this kind of, I, I think that's the confidence thing that uh, maybe you could do something special in this world after all kind of feeling. I, I definitely, I mean, this is a thing I think everybody wrestles with to an extent, right? We all, we are truly the protagonists in our own lives. Yeah. And so it's a natural bias, human bias, to feel to feel special. And I think, and in some ways we are special. Every single person is special because you are that, the, the universe does, the world literally does revolve around you. That's the thing in, in some respect. But of course, if you then zoom out and take the amalgam of everyone's experiences, then no, it doesn't. So there is this shared sort of objective reality but sorry, this objective reality that is shared, but then there's also this subjective reality, which is truly unique to you. And I think both of those things coexist. And it's not like one is correct and one isn't. And again, anyone who's like, uh, oh no, your lived experience is everything versus your lived experience is nothing. No, it's it's, it's a blend between these two things. They can exist concurrently. But, but there's a certain kind of sense that at least I've had my whole life. And I think a lot of people have this. It's like, well, I'm just a, like this little person. Surely I can't be one of those people that do the big thing. Right. There's all these big people doing big things. There's big actors and actresses, big musicians. There's big uh, business owners and all that kind of stuff, scientists and so on. I, you know, I have my own subject experience that I enjoy Mm -hmm. and so on, but there's like a different layer. Like, um, surely I can't do those great things. I mean, one of the things just having interacted with um, um, a lot of great people, I realized, no, they're like, just the same, the same, the same humans as me, and that realization I think is really empowering. And like for to to remind yourself, but are they? Huh? But are they? Are they? <laughs> uh, uh, well, in depends terms, on some. Yeah, they're like a bag of insecurities and yes, um, 
peculiar sort of like the, their own little weirdnesses and so on. Um, I, I should say also not, um, they have the capacity for brilliance, but they're not generically brilliant. Like, you know, we, we, we tend to say this person or that person is brilliant, mm -hmm. but really, no, they're just like sitting there and thinking through stuff, just like the rest of us. Right. I, I think they're in, in the habit of thinking through stuff seriously, and they've built up a habit of not allowing them their mind to get trapped in a bunch of bullshit and minutia of day-to-day -day life. They really think big ideas, but those big ideas, it's like allowing yourself the freedom to think big, to realize that you 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 can be one that actually solve this particular big problem. First identify a big problem that you care about, and then like, I can actually be the one that solves this problem. And like allowing yourself to believe that. And I think sometimes you do need to have like yeah. that shock go through your body and a voice tells you, you're gonna win this tournament. Well, exactly. And and whether it was, it's, it's this idea of uh, useful fictions. So again, like going through the, or like the, ra the classic rationalist training of less wrong, where it's like, you want your map, you know, the, the, the image you have of the world in your head to as accurately match up with how the world actually is. Yeah. You want the map and the territory to perfectly align as, you know, you want it to be uh, as an accurate representation as possible. I don't know if I fully subscribe to that anymore, having now had these moments of like feeling of something either bigger or just actually just being overconfident. Like there, there's, there is value in overconfidence sometimes. I do. If you would, you know, take, you know, take Magnus Carlsen, right? If he, I'm sure from a young age, he knew he was very talented, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was also had something in him to, well, actually, maybe he's a bad example because he truly is the world's greatest. Um, but someone who, it was unclear whether they were going to be the world's greatest, but ended up doing extremely well because they had this innate, deep self-confidence, this like even overblown uh, idea of how good their relative skill level is. That gave them the confidence to then pursue this thing and they're like with the kind of focus and dedication that it requires to excel in whatever it is you're trying to do, you know? And so there are these useful fictions and that's where I think I diverge slightly with the classic, um, the classic sort of rationalist community um, because that's an, a field that is worth studying um, of, of like how the stories we tell, what the stories we tell to ourselves, even if they are actually false and even if we suspect they might be false, um, how it's better to sort of have that like little bit of faith, um, the, like value in faith, I think actually. And that's partly another thing that's like now led me to explore, um, you know, the concept of God, whether you want to call it a simulator, <laughs> the classic the theological thing. I think we're all like elucidating to the same thing. Now, I don't know, I'm not saying, you know, because obviously the Christian God is like, you know, all benevolent, um, endless love, the simulation one of the, at least one of the simulation hypotheses is like, as you said, like a teenager in its bedroom who doesn't really care, doesn't give a shit how it, about the individuals within there. It just like wants to see how this thing plays out because it's curious and it could turn it off like that. You know, where on the, you know, where on the sort of psychopathy to benevolent spectrum God is, I don't know. Um, but having, having this, just having a little bit of faith that there is something else out there that might be interested in our outcome is I think an essential thing actually for people to to find a because it creates commonality between it's it's something we can all share and like it like it is uniquely humbling of all of us to an extent it's like a, a like a common objective, um, but b it gives people that little bit of like reserve you know when things get really dark and I do think things are going to get pretty dark over the next few years, um, but it gives that like that to think that there's something out there that actually wants our game to keep going. I keep calling it the game, you know, uh, it's a thing C and I, like we call it the game. Um, you, you, know, you, uh, you and C is AKA Grimes, Grimes yeah. we, call, we call what the game, Every, the whole thing? Every, yeah, we, we, we joke about like- So everything is a game. Not, well, the, the universe, like what if, what if it's a game and the, the goal of the game is to figure out like, well, either how to beat it, how to get out of it. You know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe this universe is an escape room, like a giant escape room. And the goal is to figure out, put all the pieces to puzzle, figure out how it works 
in order to like unlock this like hyperdimensional key and get out beyond what it is. That's no, but but then the, so you're saying it's like different levels and it's like a cage within a cage within a cage and never like cage, one cage at a time. You figure out how to escape right. that. Um, like and you level up, you know, like us up. becoming multiplanetary would be a level up, or us, you know, find, figuring out how to upload our consciousnesses to the thing that would probably be a leveling up, or spiritually, you know, humanity becoming more combined and and less adversarial and and uh, bloodthirsty, and us becoming a little bit more enlightened that would be a leveling up. You know, there's many different frames to it, yeah. whether it's physical, you know, digital, uh, or like metaphysical. I wonder what the level? I think I think level one for Earth is probably the biological evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. It's like going from single cell organisms to, to early humans. Then maybe level two is what whatever is happening inside our minds and creating ideas and creating technologies. That's like evolutionary process of ideas. Mm -hmm. And then uh, multiplanetary is interesting. Is that fundamentally different from what we're doing here on earth? Probably, because it allows us to like exponentially scale. It, and... it, it, it delays the Malthusian trap, right? It, it, it's a way to keep the playing field, get, to make the playing field get larger so that we can, it can accommodate more of our stuff, more of us. Um, and that's a good thing, but I don't know if it like fully solves this issue um, of... Uh, well, this thing called Moloch, which we haven't talked about yet, but um, which is basically, I call it the the god of unhealthy competition. 